Hello everyone and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today I'm delighted to talk to Professor Linda Woodhead. You're most welcome, Linda. Thank you, lovely to be here. Thank you. For those who don't know, Professor Linda Woodhead is a British academic specializing in religious studies and sociology at King's College here in London. Now, the BBC reported a couple of weeks ago but that for the first time, fewer than half of people in England and Wales describe themselves as Christian, according to the 2021 census. The proportion of people who said they were Christian was 46.2% down from 59.3% in the last census in 2011. And in contrast, the number who said they had no religion increased to 37% of the population, up from a quarter. And interestingly, those who identify as Muslim rose from 4.9% in 2011 to 6.5% last year. So today, Linda has kindly agreed to discuss uh, the burning question, is Britain still a Christian country? So over to you, Linda. Thank you. I should perhaps sub have subtitled this and, and why so few people like the answer. Uh, <laughs> and I'll come back to, to that. I have discovered that on talking about this topic. Uh, mm. It's uh, it's very, it, my answer is very unpopular and my answer is um, <laughs> one that's but sociologically based. Right. And I think I will explain why I think few people like the answer. I think that's a very interesting part of the whole issue. So it's not just about the actual data, really. There's a lot more at stake here. People have a very big stake in this on either side. I'll come back to that point. But let's just try and tackle the question in as objective a way we can, using the best evidence that we can. And, um, well, I'll start a little anecdote. I was just buying some Christmas cards yesterday because it's that time of year at the moment. and in the local supermarket there were quite a lot of christmas cards but there was only one that had a, a a christian theme of any kind it said oh holy night on the christmas card mm. and that's um that's a fairly indicative thing we all celebrate christmas the entire supermarket is dedicated to christmas <laughs> but christianity has become quite a niche interest at christmas <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and not easy to supply it so mm. that is telling us something. Mm. Well, if we, I mean, I think the way to approach it perhaps most usefully is to remember that religion, all religions are, are complex things that have a number of strands. Religion is not one thing. It's not just the beliefs. It's not just the going to a church or a mosque. It's more complex. And I think that there are, um, I'll go through five things that I think are particularly important and we can look at whether in relation to those, Britain is still Christian. Mm. Um, let me start with, with one that often it gets neglected, and that's, let's call it cosmology or metaphysics, the way we look at the whole universe, the way we see our place in relation to the wider picture. I think our cosmology is no longer Christian. Mm. It's some kind of mix of, you know, people believe in the Big Bang, they say, and they're influenced by astrophysics and they have a sense of the of, of being a vast expanding universe and mm. we get pictures beamed back to us um, and we can see how unimaginably vast and beyond our perceptive apparatus it is and I think that has completely won out over the Christian metaphysic which is of uh, in a way a much smaller cosmos with a creator god who brings it into being at a moment of time and will will end it at a moment of time that was the christian framework for our, mm. for most of our history and i think it's lost ground and i think christians are quite um um reluctant to really own up to that and be honest about it and talk about it mm -hmm. so there's one area i think we're not a christian country anymore um actually the united states is more because creationism is is a, a certain version of it is a modern version is more more prevalent there. Yeah. Um, um, community would be another aspect. My second aspect of what a religion is. Religions 
often provide strong community. They provide it in a small sense that you would go to church in relation to Christianity and you would belong to your parish in this country. Um, that has, we haven't been Christian in that sense for a long time. The, the number of people attending mm -hmm. church now on a typical Sunday is down to about five or possibly six percent of the population. Wow. So small numbers. Uh, do people still have a sense of belonging to a parish? Much less so for lots of interesting reasons, which we can talk about if you like. Um, so community, absolutely, we're not Christian in the sense of our communities and people don't want to go to church it, mm. uh, any mm. longer. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you could say there's a bigger sense in which um, of community, which this country was Christian, and that was being English or Scottish, um, mm. the Church of England, the Church of Scotland. Mm. And the chapels in Wales gave a sense of ethnic or national identity. Uh, that is still there to some extent. You could see it in the Brexit vote where Anglicans were more likely to be pro-Brexit. But those were older people. So um, mm. Mm. that's much less common amongst younger people. And I guess it's going to die out. Mm. So community, I'd say no, we're not uh, we're not Christians in where we find community anymore. Uh, my third thing would be ethics and values mm. uh, and when people tick christian on the census in the la in the um in um the last census some people did research and they went round and asked why abby day was one of the sociologists she went and asked people why did you tick that and and one of the answers was well i'd like to think i'm a christian so that's about that's about uh, how you behave and a lot of people would say, I'd like, I think we've, uh, Christian values are still really important. Um, I don't think actually, though, that it's right. I think that the Christian ethic has has been replaced quite recently, actually. But the mm. Christian, there's no such thing as the Christian ethic. But the ethic that was dominant in the 20th century was one that, that elevated self-sacrificial love or agape. And you can see it in the, you know, the war memorials um, were in the shape of a, crucifix or a cross to symbolize the greatest sacrifice of love the christian value that mm. people were dying for people don't believe in self-sacrifice um, yes. in that sense now we believe much more I, I call it a shift from a give your life to a live your life ethic we believe much more yes. in you know, living your life to the full and really supporting other people yes to do the same thing not giving your life so that's yeah. that's a different ethic. I think we have lost um, the Christian ethic, or the church's ethic is not what people listen to anymore, for sure. Gosh. And um, and then I'll do a fourth one, and then I'll come to where I think we are still Christian. My fourth mm. one would be spirituality. I mean, absolutely important for religion, obviously, um, uh, and and often neglected by sociologists, but quite wrongly, is that religion is primarily, in a sense, about putting people in relationship with higher power, with God, with gods, with spirits, with with um, the beyond, the transcendent. Mm. And I think if religion, I don't think that's, that's essential for religions. They can go a long time without doing that for people, but not that long. You know, I think they die out when people find they're not really providing them with genuine spiritual relation. Uh, so does Christianity, is it the main place people go for spirituality, for contact with the divine these days? It's very hard to research that. It's very hard to answer that. Mm -hmm. My, I think yes and no. Um, older people who are brought up Christian much more likely if they are deeply spiritual to find it in that framework. Younger people much more likely to be attracted to alternative forms of spirituality. We could see in the census that's just come out that that's been growing very fast. Mm. Uh, you can write in and that paganism, Wicca, other, you know, other forms of shamanism and those are growing very fast. Um, so in a way, you could say um, maybe those have always been around, you know, much more magical ways of encounter of enchanting life. But now they've really there's no stigma and they've come to the fore yes, again. No stigma left. That's right. Mm. No stigma. And of course, there are other forms of religion as well. And people are very interested in Islam. Young people are more likely to probably to have a Muslim friend who's talking a lot about their faith or as likely as mm. a Christian friend. So other mm. forms of other ways of, of 
of, of, of engaging with the divine as well. So um, that's the that's the fourth one, the spirituality. And, and and finally, I think there's one sense in which we are still a Christian country, and that's that it is institutionalized yeah. in this country. Yeah. You know, I, you could say it's built in and it's baked in. It's built in the environment everywhere. Um, how how towns and cities are laid out, where the sacred buildings are, um, where the church is in every village, in every city. It's in the architecture, it's in the place names, it's in the calendar, it's in our festivals, I started with Christmas, um, it's in our ceremonies, we're about to have a coronation of a new king, it's, um, it's in our symbols, our rituals, it's in a lot of everyday practices and language still. You know, it's mm. there even if you don't know what it, where it comes from. It's mm. there in the way that Parliament's laid out like a chapel. You know, it's, in, it's there in all sorts of things people don't even notice now because they're just so much accustomed. And that's actually a very strong way in which religions have always persisted and lasted very long. It's not insignificant at all. And it can support a, a sort of loose sense of community of being a Christian because, well, we're a Christian country, aren't we? We've got all these things. Um, and people who aren't Christian might say that. Sometimes Muslims say that. You don't realise how Christian you are, but I can see it because it's other to me. So four, and I've said kind of four ways in which we're probably not Christian anymore. Spirituality was a question mark. Um, and a fifth way in which we are. So that's, I think, partly why people don't like the answer, because the answer is, to, are we, is Britain still a Christian country? The answer is no and yes. <laughs> 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 and that's not an answer that people like. There's another reason people don't like that answer. Yes. <laughs> because there are people like Tom Holland or um, before him, Roger Scruton or Edward Norman, you know, historians and philosophers and so on. Uh, in the media, perhaps the Daily Mail, um, main line in the Daily Mail, it doesn't like the answer because it wants us to be a Christian country, because it has a certain set of values that it wants to uphold and it identifies tags them as Christian. I think that's that's why. Yeah. Um, so that constituency doesn't like the answer. And then often the media and certainly explicit secularists don't like the answer because they want to say we are not a Christian country. <laughs> <laughs> the first like don't like it because they want to say we are a Christian country. The second group don't like it because they want to say we are absolutely, definitely not a Christian country. Look at the census. <laughs> it yeah. tells you less than half. Yes. Um, and and, and some, sometimes one of the reasons people don't like the answer that we the, the no and yes answer is because they it's become very common for people because they're distanced from religion to think that religion, that to take a fundamentalist view, even though they're secular, to think that actually being religion means going to church and believing the creeds well that, that's a very odd way of looking at religion you know it didn't it doesn't really work like that but that's that, that view has become quite widespread so on that understanding mm. no of course we're not a christian country mm. uh, a final group who don't like the answer are um, christians from outside the uk particularly from colonial countries formerly colonial countries who see Britain, you know, as a terrible example of awful Christian decline and secularism, needing missionary help. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. they, so they want it to be absolutely secular. Uh, very religious people from outside the UK see it as, as a, you know, an emblem of, sec of secularism and uh, decay, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a very ideologically loaded issue, I think. Yes. Yes, well, th thank you for that. It's fascinating. The complexity of it, there's not a simple yes or no. It's yes or no and yes or yes and no, uh, of course. <laughs> and, and I mean, officially, one could argue, um, and you just touched on it uh, a bit, that we are officially a Christian country. The king and the queen are the head mm. of the Church of England, mm. no less, which mm. is the established church. It's the official mm. church of, mm. the, of England, um, mm. the Church of England. Uh, the House of Lords, which is part of the Palace of Westminster, the second chamber of Parliament, is stuffed full of, if that's the right word, stuffed full of <laughs> Anglican bishops, um, mm. who are there by virtue of the fact that they are Anglican bishops. Uh, mm. that, that is their qualification. Um, so they actually have a, a, a formal legal part of the process of legislation in this country. Mm. Um, so in that sense, we're very much uh, officially Christian, but all the other things you say are very real as well. Was it five, six percent of the population go to church uh, in uh, mm. now? Like mm. Any church, yeah. Home. But yeah, any mm. church. Um, mm. And there was another little vignette here in, in my limited experience of funerals uh, in, in the UK. Mm -hmm. and 
and how they are conducted, the kinds of mm. services that people have now, as opposed to the mm. past. And I've noticed that many there's an, uh, an increasing emphasis on celebrating the life of the deceased at a funeral service, as opposed to in the past. Well, here's a dear Christian mm. soul who has left us and gone to heaven or gone to Jesus, mm. or whatever. You know, mm. the afterlife and the day of judgment are a much more eschatological or otherworldly understanding of a funeral service. Now it's, well, let's celebrate Fred's life, you know, oh, he was a great guy, and let's play Frank Sinatra songs or whatever mm. at the funeral. Mm. Nothing to do mm. with you, Frank Sinatra. Um, so it's become more secularized and this worldly, and that transition, as you said, from a kind of selfless, self a sacrificial understanding of love to um, celebrating the life of that person, the here and now. Uh, in the dunya, as Muslims put it, and and that that is a funeral. I mentioned the funeral service because that is a, an indicator of how people's mm. perception of life and death have changed as well as an indicator mm. of the loss mm. of Christian presence in our country. Mm. And there's another. I mean, it, funerals have just pluralized very rapidly. The church has lost control of funerals, which is very yeah. recent. The, the established church used to do the vast majority of funerals. That was just automatic. That's changed in my lifetime to being not at all automatic. And there are a whole range. And you're seeing also with younger generations now a rejection of the more secular funeral. And mm. there is a lot more. If you go around a graveyard, you'll see an awful lot of uh, angel symbolism yes. and dream catchers and windmills and uh, yes. benches and a very strong sense that the dead live on, that the spirits of the dead are available to us, communicate with us still. Yes. The, the, so the, 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 not a secular, not a secular approach. Not a secular. And, and this is a really important point here because I said earlier that um, according to the census, there's a 2021 census in the UK or England and Wales anyway, not in Scotland who uh, have have a different census. Mm. The number who said they had no religion increased to 37 percent of the population uh, mm. up from the quarter. Now I remember I saw some tweets from some atheists saying, "Aha, atheism is 37 percent of the population are mm. atheists," and you know, and I thought. No, that's not what's happened at all, actually. Mm. What we're seeing is a shift from formal religious allegiance, going to church, uh, you know, I'm a Roman Catholic, I'm a Church of England, to um, unofficial spiritual expressions of religiosity from beneath, from the grave. It's kind of coming from beneath rather than top down. Mm. And, mm. and as you say, in, in, in the graveyards and the way that people, mm. uh, loved ones are mem uh, remembered, um, we're seeing a, 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 an evolution or development mm. of religiosity rather mm. than a secularization to such an extent that any kind of religious sentiment however defined is extinguished from our lives that's not happened it's just morphed into something different would that be yes. accurate that's really true so uh, um and so no one answer is ever right and why should it be we are not secular and we're not becoming increasingly secular we are not religious and becoming increasingly <laughs> religious these mm. monolithic views that it's all going to go one way until we're all going to homogeneously be the same it's just not happened so so all those predictions whether it was we're going to evangelize mm. the whole country which people thought at the beginning of the 20th century everyone's going to become christian or oh. it's going to become increasingly scientific and secular no one's going to be religious both yes. wrong it, yes. it, in, in a way what's won out i suppose is sort of um is um is sort of human rights and the law that we are in a country where you have the freedom to choose your religion or belief and people do and that's become in a way a kind of new sacred so most parents mm. think it's up to my child to decide and indeed most children do decide for themselves now and they decide different things so we have this rich plur diversity and pluralism of different and competing views, mm, religious yeah, and non-religious. Yes, and I mean, the, the question um, here of uh, the remarkable statistic uh, of those identifying as Muslim in in, in England and Wales rose from 4.9% in 2011 to 65 mm. Mm. Uh, last year. And many would say, oh, well, that's just immigration, of course, people mm. from the, uh, you know, Pakistan or and of course that is true to some extent but it's not the only reason because these people could just become very secularized like the christians have but i, I think mm. you've noted that that's not happening and that mm. muslims are retaining the integrity of their faith as as a, a fairly conservative understanding mm. of life the universe and everything uh, and also sexual mor mores social mores traditional gender roles and so on but wh why, why is the muslim community um you know uh persisting in its the integrity of its faith whereas other mm. faith 
communities are seeing its um, you know, mm. deconstruction and decline, as you've described? Mm. Uh, um, I think a number of answers. I mean, one one is that um, Islam is important to maintaining a sense of a, a minority identity. Mm. Um, so my, minorities often do do better. You know, my, religious minorities support have strong support, internal support for that identity because they have to fight for their identity against the majority. That's part of the answer. Also because Islam, like Judaism, is much better at passing on the faith domestically. It doesn't need clergy. It doesn't need mosques. It can do it at home. And that's an effective form of transmission. It's being done in the home by parents and it can be celebrated in the home. And particularly for women, that's the case in Islam. Mm -hmm. Um, but Islam's actually been also very successful in establishing after school places of learning um, for children and in transmitting the faith in those sorts of ways. Uh, and actually, British Islam is really significant, I think, in the world, on the world Islamic scene, because it's actually rather creative and we're now into third or fourth generation of Muslims. Mm. So the initial battles have been won. Of course, there's all still a huge amount of ill feeling and Islamophobia, but the initial battles have been won. The infrastructure's there, the community's established, it's counted in the census, it's got basic infrastructure, you can get halal food, there are mosques and so yeah. on. The early generations had to really struggle for that, but now that's there. Mm. So there's confidence about it, and it's allowing young people and students today, and many are going into higher education, lots of my students are Muslim, to explore their faith, um, to experiment with new forms of Islamic music and poetry and creativity, and it's become quite a cool form of Islam worldwide that other yeah. young Muslims look to. So um, I think we're seeing a lot of, it very, I, I've watched this space, I think there's a, the, the kind of creativity that Christianity used to foster in young people. I think Islam is doing very successfully with young Muslims in Britain today. Could you, you said this, I, I, I'm quoting you here from a recent lecture, uh, Islam is central mm. to emerging Muslim youth identities in the UK and it's still cool. I mean, you use this mm. unacademic mm. word, <laughs> uh, cool. <laughs> Unlike Christianity, this is a verbatim quote, I think, mm. British Muslim cultural output <laughs> is cool mm. around the world. So it's not just within the UK, mm. globally. Now, why is it so cool? Mm. What, what is it that's been exported that globally is, is thought to be so cool? It's partly fashion, it's dress, it's music, it's all things that are important in young people's cultures. Um, and it's partly, I think, because there isn't, because there isn't a clergy with real control in mm. Islam, like there is in the churches. So clergy make things very uncool. <laughs> when you've got older people <laughs> around, of course it's not cool. You know, parents, clergy, anyone older who's right. putting restrictions around what you can say and do is going to make it extremely uncool for, for, for you know, um, modern young people. And, and Islam, you know, young people, young Muslims have a sense freer to do but their own thing. There's a paradox here because you, you say that, and I, I take that as, as from a sociological point of view, what you say makes sense. However, mm. Islam mm. of all religions is a religion by definition. The word Islam in Arabic means submission. And so you, you're not free to make up your rule. As a Muslim, you're not free. You, you look to your creator for guidelines and, and parameters uh, and, mm -hmm. and law mm -hmm. for how you live your life. It, it's a very structured religion in that sense. I mean, mm -hmm. there are lots of things that are, are not permissible. Mm -hmm. Just cohabiting mm -hmm. a mad woman is not permissible. Um, yeah. This is quite strict. And yet our wider culture has no problem with men, uh, men and women cohabiting. And yet it's completely taboo. And everyone accepts it's taboo, by the way. Um, even those who break the rules still understand mm -hmm. that it's a rule that is being broken. So there's a paradox here. They're not sociologically. I get what mm -hmm. you're saying. But religiously, the religion is very clear on right and wrong, haram, halal, in how we live our lives. Sure. Y yes, very often it is. But... I, I'm deciding. I'm I'm deciding. I'm looking at the online fact world. I'm looking at I'm learning it. I'm looking at the Quran. I've learned Arabic. I'm deciding for myself. Um right. you know, that's 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 of course you're doing it, you're trying to understand what it's telling you. Um but you're not deferring to an older guy. That's what's not cool. No, that's an interesting uh, distinction there. Um, 
you also asked uh, uh, you've also asked i think a, a particularly insightful question if i can put it like this you asked will islam keep intellectually vi will it remain intellectually mm. vibrant mm. And you said that is the key question, I think. And I think that's a very good question. And mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm very happy uh, that being patronized, uh, that you, you reference explicitly reference Cambridge Muslim College with um, uh, Abdul Hakim Murad, other, otherwise known as Tim Winter at Cambridge University. He's the dean and founder there. And now there's a, there's a whole host of other academics, young generation of scholars who are now mm -hmm. uh, on the staff there who are teaching a new generation of Muslim leaders and academics mm -hmm. and thinkers. Mm -hmm in the uk and i think mm -hmm. the, the reach of this is going to be if not already global um and i think you, you you highlighted that as an example of actually uh intellectual vibrancy in the mm. uh, indigenous british muslim culture i did i think and the bigger point is um there's a sort of internal debate i think in british islam about whether the version that says oh islam's a religion of law and ethics is going to win out um, and it's been very dominant and powerful for a long time, or whether the, the, the view that says there's a really strong theological tradition and we shouldn't neglect it and say it's all about ethics and law. Um, and I think Tim Winter and Cambridge School stand more for that. Mm. Um, and so they ask bigger questions as well. Mm. And this is about keeping intellectually vibrant. If we go back to my you know, metaphysics, cosmology really matters uh, and open ethical debate really matters as well and religions that don't keep an intellectual tradition alive don't last very long i think that was part of the problem with the churches in britain the churches withdrew particularly church of england and the catholic church withdrew from intellectual life they literally withdrew their training from universities which had always been the case uh, for clergy quite recently and um they became increasingly anti-intellectual and i think that's always it's always the death knell for religion because young people ask big questions and if they don't get satisfactory answers they go somewhere else where they are going to find them. i think i think that, that that's absolutely true there's also the sense and this is my own personal subjective non-academic perspective it is that uh, and I, I don't, i'm not trying to be rude here but the church of england is, is often seen as just irrelevant to life um uh it, it, but in contrast to a religion like islam which offers uh it's called the deen you know the, the sense of uh, a comprehensive understanding of life mm. in its totality not just mm. theology but law ethics you know mm. marriage uh, inheritance finance you name it there's it uh it's all encompassing within the deen and and that that uh and so it's seen as offering answers to you know how should i live my life how should i relate to my employer how should i treat my wife you know um should i be just and caring to my neighbors well the answer of course in islam and in christianity is yes um so it offers th this helpful way of navigating and living a life before god and it's perceived right or wrong that the church of england say simply doesn't have that comprehensive um uh, um pack not package mm -hmm. but um, way of living life religion in the mm -hmm. broadest sense by which people can access and live in it's something you do on sundays you you may go at christmas you mm -hmm. may go uh, and maybe you might have the vicar for the funeral, maybe for the baptism, perhaps. Mm. That's kind of it. Whereas in Islam, you have Ramadan every year, which is like a, a, a very a much mm. absorbing, uh, you know, time of fasting. And so it's much more community and and based uh, and a, a, an integrated understanding of life. That may, that may be the strength of Islam over against, say, the Church of England. I'm going to disagree with you here. I'm going to find Good. myself defending the Church of England. Um, <laughs> I mean, if Islam in this country lasts for as long as the Church of England, with as much strength, it'll be doing unbelievably well. Think how long the Church of England maintained enormous influence in, in this country. It's astonishing, mm. its achievement. How did it do that? It did that, I think, by having a very, very compelling, comprehensive um, view of the kind you're talking about. It didn't have to do it as explicitly as Islam as a minority in a majority has to do it, finding their way in a country that's an alien country and often hostile, it was the majority. So you can you can do it in a much more implicit way, but 
um, people were brought until very recently, people were brought up in that context. It was just part of the fabric of life. It provided mm. a very clear set of values. It provided an absolutely clear set of rituals and ceremonies for your individual life from cradle to grave and for the cycle of the Christian year. And yeah. it regulated the whole local community. So it's just what you're saying when it was in it, when it was successful and it was for a very long time. That's what it did. Mm. It ceased to be able to do that for various reasons, only mm. relatively recently, only two or three generations ago. If that, yeah, I think that is a very good, very good answer. And, and I think um, the the Muslim community, and this is the, the slight danger of seeing it as the Muslim minority community in Britain. Muslims see themselves as part of a global Ummah, which absolutely. is absolutely, absolutely. Two billion people, and globally, uh, Islam is uh, very much on the rise numerically, and in terms of perhaps mm. gaining its confidence and its own understanding of, of itself, identity, and, and so on. And that's still ongoing and playing out. We've seen mm. in this issue emerging even during the World Cup with the support from uh, Morocco amongst many non-Moroccan uh, Muslims because it was seen as a Muslim team mm. who prayed, did subdued, and so on. Mm. Um, and so it's it's not like just like the Church of England, which was a national mm. church. Uh, very much not part of the Roman Catholic communion. That was the whole point it's of it. It's very true. Very, It's a uh, very different kind of church. It's extremely important to realise that. People get confused and think all oh, churches are like each other. They're not. Mm, They're incredibly no, different. No. So you're right. The nearest analogue to British Islam is British Roman Catholicism, yes. or rather English and Scottish, because they were quite different, really. Um, yes. And that was a minority faith, you know, since the Reformation. Yeah. Uh, in the 16th century that was a persecuted minority uh, mm. for a long time and it developed that sense for that reason and then um, you know that sense of minority status was reinforced in the 19th century when it went up with Irish migration so Catholicism yeah. was a migrant religion with people who were looked down on um, in really quite similar ways and there was violence and prejudice against Catholics and that lives on in the way that Catholics in this country think of themselves as well mm -hmm. so very very different from the majority churches mm -hmm. in Scotland and, 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 and England Absolutely, uh, that's, that's a, a much better analogy I think with the, with the, mm. the Catholic presence in, in England as part mm. of the universal communion as they see themselves, the, the body of Christ as they call themselves. Yes, that, that, yeah, that's the point, the uh, point I was trying, I forgot to say, but yeah, yes, that's the, the analogy. Or poor understanding that we are a limb of this larger body, uh, it's obviously a metaphor. Yes, so even though we're oppressed in this country, we know that we've got this, you know, we're yes. actually bigger worldwide exactly. and that gives a very distinct sense. Yes. And and, and, that, and that is the same. Uh, there's certainly a parallel there, an analog with the the Muslim Ummah, uh, a global. And even so, the corporeal metaphor is there in um, some of the hadiths uh, as as well. But but this but but doesn't this whole discussion isn't it distorted? It, 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 it might give the impression that religion is on the decline as such. Now you're not saying that. You're saying religion in the UK is on the decline. But of course, globally. Uh, this is not the case, or, or even in Eastern Europe, Poland, Hungary, Russia, uh, Africa, South America, religion, Christianity and Islam are still very much vibrant, alive face and are not declining. It just seems to be there. I mean, you may disagree because mm. you, you're the expert, but it seems to me this is a Western European issue problem and to some extent in the united states which is kind of lagging behind but we're seeing similar kinds of processes dynamics going on there although religion there is still more robust arguably um but in western europe and perhaps canada new zealand and okay. australia the, the the former colonies we, we are seeing a decline but this is unusual i'm, I'm saying that this is a minority mm. in a much more robust rosy picture for religious mm. uh life and vitality globally would you agree with that i think probably yes but um it's not it's not just western europe um former former communist countries are often highly non-religious as well and yeah, some have some have yeah. some have re-sacralized that is unusual you know like 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 we didn't expect it but that has happened in in, in russia be an obvious example some haven't like czechoslovakia and east germany extremely secular very secular. Britain isn't the most secular country in the world. Um, of course, the whole of China comes out as very non-religious on surveys, but that's mm. a bit misleading. Yeah. There are yeah. because if you go to China, you'll see all sorts of local spiritual practices, but they don't fit any. They're not, none of the world religions, and there's a political, obviously, a political reason as well why people don't say they're religious yeah. in China. Yeah. So, so the world picture is complex. Um, I think it's also complex. Um, 
because we've got very, very poor data from a lot of places. So mm. in Africa, everyone always says Africa is incredibly religious. Well, yes and no, I think, when you go there. Um, uh, and it depends where. And um, actually, people often go, it is very religious in the sense that people go to lots of different churches and traditional practices, but mm. they get they get sort of five times counted. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. I'm always a bit wary of the of the it's incredibly growing everywhere kind of mm. picture. But you're right on the whole, you know, non-religion and secularism is definitely um, a minority uh, a minority approach historically mm -hmm. and globally. But but this is important because I mean I, I'm not a sociologist and you are, but I mean I seem to vaguely remember uh, eminent sociologist, the American Peter Berger uh, from mm. I think. Boston University, who in his early career, and he died recently, I think, uh, was a great advocate and proponent of this idea of secularization. Look, as mm. modernity increases and uh, modernism and so on, uh, mm. religious uh, belief is going to decline because of the rise of science and alternative cosmologies and so on, secularization. Mm. And he said recently in, in a video uh, at the end of a, a very long and distinguished career as a sociologist that he was just wrong. He admitted mm. that this was just a failed hypothesis that mm. secularization as expected by the sociologists had not actually happened and that religion uh, obviously he's referring globally mm. uh, was very much on the ascendant and engaging people mm. passionately people are passionate about faith i don't mm. necessarily mean in the church of england i'm sorry uh, to be rude mm. about the church of england but i mean globally and so this hasn't happened what why do sociologists get it so wrong do you think um i think it it was there was a wide it wasn't just sociology it was a um a social scientific in the broad sense view that religion would decline as societies modernized mm. and it was a very western enlightenment view yeah. yes. it was an ideologically driven view that that science will inevitably drive out religion because religion is superstitious and will become more and more rational and science and therefore religion will disappear. So it was it was it wasn't really an empirically tested hypothesis. It was an ideological hope for Western yeah. scientific domination. <laughs> which has has not come about. No. But as I say, I think we just have to abandon this idea that there's one answer that everywhere is getting everywhere. The world's getting more religious. Insofar as Peter Berger is saying that, that's not true either. Or the world's getting more secular. You have to, the better, much better sociologist is David Martin, who was the first to say back in the 70s to attack the secularization thesis and say, look at each each nation because it's got a distinct history and something distinct is going to happen. And that's right. what's happened. So if you look at Iran now, um, mm. uh, again, it's hard to get very accurate data, but it, there's an awful lot of indications that Iran has become incredibly secular. Yes, yes. You know, and more secular than atheist, Britain. Even. Yeah, no, absolutely. And yeah. strongly atheist because yeah. of the particular, you know, political yeah. alliance of religion that mm. that people now reject because of yeah. its abuses. The yeah. same thing has happened in the United States, which everyone said, oh, it's, gonna, it's exceptionally religious. It's an exception to the case. But there's been a collapse uh, mm. in the last 25 years of Christianity in the US and it is now being demonstrated by good evidence that that is tied up with Christianity getting captured by the evangelical right and those who don't belong to that therefore disavowing Christianity amongst young people so mm -hmm. there are very specific stories that go with the political circumstances of different parts of the world and and we have to just realize it's actually more diverse and there isn't ever going to be one meta narrative that's going to going to tell you and insofar as sociologists want to believe in a single meta narrative don't distrust them <laughs> right the, 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 the meta narrative is there is no meta narrative there, there is no overarching uh, single one size fits all um you know model of everywhere it, it is different depending uh, iran is a particularly mm. unique case i think because of the uh, extraordinary events that are happening at the moment and then disillusion mm. people must be feeling it what is perceived to be mm. the very oppressive um uh, mm. harsh uh, re regime uh, there and I, I know nothing about mm. Iran, but that's mm. the impression one gets and of course very similar or look at ireland look at what's happened in ireland yeah. for very similar reasons mm. terrible true. abuses of power by a religious institution that was dominant and it just collapses you know incredibly quickly when when that in that, those conditions religion can go yes. very swiftly it's interesting because Islam more generally um, has, as, as you know, no clergy. I mean, obviously, Shia, the Shia understanding of Islam 
a part, the 10% or the 90% of Sunni Islam. There is no clergy, there's no hierarchy, uh, there's no priesthood lording it over or people to mm. tell you what to do. Um, it mm. has a kind of demotic kind of grassroots appeal to it, but by attraction rather than authoritarianism. Um, mm. I I Iran mm. being an exception because of its unique uh, history, history. Mm. And, and, that, and, and that is both a weakness given there isn't a caliphate, there isn't a, a single mm. imam who uh, historically has uh, been the ruler, the, like think of the Ottoman Empire and preceding that, but also, um, a, a, as you say, an attraction because you don't have the younger people don't feel there's an older authority figure telling them what mm. to do. They, they can mm. choose to identify with uh, a, a way of life which they find intrinsically attractive. Mm. Okay, so um, in terms of the future, then uh, I mean, you don't have a crystal ball, I take it. But um, <laughs> are, are you thinking in terms? Okay, so soci some sociologists have liked to, as we've already discussed, make predictions about the future, and mm. some of them are not just sociologists, as you rightly say. Uh, some of them got it wrong in the past. So I'm going to ask you to do what <laughs> might be careless, But what is your uh, prediction for the future of, of Britain? Are we just going to see a continued inexorable decline mm. of? religion understood in this official traditional mm. sense and an increase in popular you mentioned paganism shamanism wiccanism and and islam and so on oh are we going to how do you see the future of rolling out because you did in your lecture mm. you you quoted from a book written i don't know 30 years ago or something which mm. actually referenced our particular chronological mm. time now and you said the predictions in that book were actually most yes. remarkably accurate Mm. Um, and I thought, wow, I didn't expect that. Um, mm. So how do you see the next 30 years rolling out for the UK, do you think? Yes. Um, that was a book called 2020 Visions that was written by um, r religious studies and sociology religion people um, 30 years ago. So it was I, I didn't expect when I picked it up that it would be so accurate, but they really yeah. got it right in this country. Yeah. Um, I think the reason they got well. They were very perceptive about a lot of the driving forces but also we do have very we've got good data now to establish trends mm. and we can be quite confident that those trends will continue in relation to the churches because they're they're so long lasting so actually christian decline in this country has been going on probably for 100 years but we know from the data for 50 years steadily every year completely steady and that is because it's actually about children not following being half as likely as their parents to be christian mm -hmm. so it's a, that's really where religious change happens so that's inexorable there's no reason to think that that's going to change and what's interesting is that nothing's made a difference it hasn't gone up and down in the 60s or mm -hmm. because of a revival or you know it just steadily goes down so i would expect that to continue the big churches to continue that and yes you will find everyone says oh but there's a evangelical church in the local you know university town that's yeah. doing well there is there's one in every university town doing well it's not even a tiny blip on the horizon or black pentecostal churches african heritage ones yes they're doing very well they're not there's such tiny numbers overall that's the <clears throat> that's why it doesn't change the trend line Gosh. um <clears throat> so that will i'm confidently say that will continue um, I'm much less confident about whether the growth in Islam, we've seen it in the latest census, Islam, Hinduism, Sikhism, Judaism is steady. I'm much less confident that will continue. I wouldn't want to predict that. It's very hard to sustain growth up across up generations. And the same with alternative spirituality, even though it's growing very rapidly, and it has been growing for two or gener three generations, because particularly in societies like ours where there's a premium on choosing your own religion mm. that means there's a premium on not just doing what your parents did so it's very hard to sustain a continuity we see this in a lot of groups that that flourish for 20 or 30 years and then they fail to get the next generation or the one after that mm -hmm. so it'll be extremely interesting to see what happens to the smaller growing mm. religions and I'm, I'm not going to predict about those but but the the continued rise of non-religion and the decline of christianity in this country i would confidently predict that will continue in our lifetimes 
Gosh, I, that's quite pessimistic. I, I know many Muslims would uh, uh, be disturbed by that because uh, they would not want uh, a robust Christian church uh, or any Christian church replaced by just a nihilistic kind of secularist emptiness. They, they would want some uh, something. Why there. would it be a nihilistic secularist emptiness? Um, because this is one of the caricatures, isn't it? Well, yes, but is there not a truth in that caricature that if if one follow if one follows Nietzsche, for example, I'm not saying the population at large. <laughs> Nietzsche, but, I don't. <laughs> um, there is a sense that you know what what is there on offer if one takes the transcendent the, the sense of uh the divine out of one's ah, presence. well i will confidently predict that the transcendent will be not taken out of the equation ah, interesting interesting i will predict another thing and i uh, this is uh, this is um I, I this is my unproven hypothesis only one in five people have ever been really spiritual and that won't change I think it's pretty steady. I just think that's steady. You know, people who really, really want, care about, are devout. The one person in your family who prayed a lot or deeply cared about their faith, changed, you know, had a strong relationship with God or spirit or mm. the powers. It's, a bit, it's a minority sport. It always has been and it always will be. And I don't think it get much. I don't think it goes up much up or down. What goes up and down is what's socially acceptable. Okay, the, the pushback from that, uh, um, from my completely non-academic, non-scholarly approach, uh, and I, that's I, my, it's a non-scholarly hypothesis that I. Well, I've, okay, I've, okay. Well, we're on the same level then. <laughs> it's a hunch. It's a hunch. We're on the same level. Well, I'm, I'm going to challenge your hunch with my hunch. I, I had a great privilege of speaking to Professor Dale Allison, who's a professor at Princeton Theological Seminary, just uh, four or five days ago, about his new book um, uh, about um secularism and religious experiences in the secular world mm. and um i don't know if you're familiar with that but it's an astonishing mm. book and um he, he's a typical kind of erudite but he doesn't he's not dogmatic he he's quite hesitant to he's talking about a range of religious experiences whether it be near-death experiences or people seeing mm. uh these loved ones or, mm. or uh, uh, the, the perceived presence of a malevolent spirit or angels mm. And so on mm. and so on. Most extraordinary accounts. And these are all now well researched. It's not just mm. gossip. There's now a lot of research showing how common these experiences are. They're not mm. uh, you know, statistically, and now people are opening up about them. In the 50s and 60s and 70s, most people were very reluctant to admit they had a religious mystical experience. Yes. Now yes. most people uh, admit that they do. Now I mm. mention this because um, if you're, was it one in five hypothesis? Uh, forget yes. the. The exact that's fraction right. you mentioned, twenty percent, in other words. The one in five uh, hypothesis. That's a good name for it. Okay, oh dear. Giving the one you in five spiritual name. hypothesis. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I get the impression from my completely uh, non-scholarly memory um, that that uh, the that is much more common than this in the population, and also randomly. It's not like religious people are having these experiences. Everyone, not everyone, but that they are equally to be found or just as likely to be found amongst atheists, self-described atheists, and non-religious people, as well as religious people. And that this is, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and whole industries that like, are de de devoted to, you know, angel worship or, you know, uh, or whatever. And I mention this because it, it just seems to be much more widespread than the 20% would suggest. Now, I'm not saying this is religion in any traditional sense, but it is a kind of spirituality slash mysticism slash concern with the supernatural slash whatever, whatever, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that, it, that really does overlap with a lot of religious, traditional religious concerns and, and cosmology, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. and, and this seems to be unaffected. So Professor Dale Allison said, unaffected by any secularization of the world. Yeah. This seems yes. to continue on and on and on, mm. regardless of what's mm. happening in the academy uh, with, with skeptical yes. scientists saying, oh, we, whatever. This just carries on anyway. And I think mm. that's remarkable. No, I think that's, that's, that's really what my, my one in five hypothesis says. I, right. I would agree with that there is this constancy of experience of the supernatural and the sacred. Mm. Um, and it, what I disagree is that it's 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 that widespread because we do have quite a lot of polling data on belief in angels and other sorts of sometimes called the paranormal, but yeah. um, spirits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a lot of polling on it now, and it tends to come out at about twenty percent of people who have these experiences. There's a difference between believing in ghosts and experiencing a ghost, but those who actually have the experiences um, and those for whom they're important, I think it's nearer one in five. But I do agree that they're 
they've they seem to have always been there sometimes you can't talk about them because they're stigmatized like you say now we can and so it's much more open but have yeah. there always been fortune tellers and wise people in every village town and city yes of course there have and there are in this country and i often i always try to make a point of going to them when i go somewhere because they're absolutely fascinating and um and far more profound and interesting in what they offer than people often think so there is there's always been that often yeah, yeah. working class often women highly mm. stigmatized and yes. a really important point you've raised here is that we have become so in a way um we've bought into the propaganda of monotheistic religions mm. that all religion is really about a god and everything else is superstition and we shouldn't take it seriously mm -hmm. that's an ideological viewpoint that wipes out the experiences of an awful lot of particularly marginalized groups and and we should pay much more attention to them and i'm delighted that Dale allison is paying attention to them yeah. i also pay attention to them and, and, and spend time have always researched amongst those groups and they're just as spiritually interesting and profound as you'll get in any monotheistic religion but they of course have different views yes i mean i think he said that there was still a, a lot of stigma attached to reporting of, of these views and he has often found that in people who say they don't believe in anything at all mm. Mm. That further questioning often mm. do reveal they have had some remarkable experiences which uh, don't fit in with that kind of non-religious paradigm so i'm not saying mm. it's Free for all now there are the people the, the pathology the pod, pathologization of ex these experiences as he calls it is still evident the medical profession psychiatric profession you know it, it's, yeah. it, 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 they're, they're explained away yeah. as psychosis or hallucination or oh you're just disturbed you're neurotic and so there is still that um uh in mainstream society there's still this medicalization mm. of it so there is a still a, 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 i there think is. He, you're yeah, completely I'm, right. I'm reporting. It's still underreported. It's not like everyone's just saying it openly, but there's been an increase yeah. in admission or admission that is happening, mm. and that's significant. But I, I suspect it's still un underappreciated as a, as a phenomenon. Um, no, there yeah. is a widespread quasi secularism in universities, in professions really? that you wouldn't, you just wouldn't say those things. I was very struck. I mean, there are mm. lots of examples in universities, but when the pandemic was on, I was at Lancaster University then, and the, you know the, the the university hierarchy put out an official sort of um, condolences to people affected by bereavement in the pandemic. It was wholly secular. Mm. You know, it was all about well, you know, we have memories and whatever. And you think actually, a lot of people don't believe that. They do believe that there is some continuing presence and afterlife, and yet it could not be spoken in a university setting. So there is a. You're right. Uh, you reminded me. There is still a lot of. Um, it's hard and that's again the kind of monotheist grip even in secularism yes that you're superstitious if you you can either be religious and believe in god or you can be secular and everything else is just superstition you could say that uh, ideologically or intellectually this derives from the protestant uh, uh um reformation uh reacting against uh, you know, the catholic belief in you know angels and saints you know a, a very kind of vibrant supernatural relationship with all, all sorts of the relics and so on and that all that's all now completely superstition um you know we don't believe in saints we don't believe in the dead appearing and all this stuff and so all that was kind of shut down for the protestant mentality historically um uh, uh, and even even well, what about islam what about judaism it's, it's a monotheistic trait isn't it to say it's all idolatry no no i, I well, actually i'm disagreeing i'm saying that's a protestant trait because i know uh, you are but i'm disagreeing uh, okay i'm saying okay <laughs> well, the counter argument is in catholicism um mm. the spirituality there is anything but shutting down of these you know the padre padre pio people go relics they go on pilgrimages mm. uh, in, in england we, we have uh, but you can't stuff. say you There's still can't say life. in catholicism um let me give you an example um uh, i was doing some interviews with catholics in fleetwood um which is in lancashire you might know hardly anyone goes to fleetwood but it's a very interesting place and um talking to a catholic and she had developed her own personal interior um stations of the cross and and wow. she went round in her sort of in prayer life you know mm. and she went from uh you know padre pio to saint jude to her deceased grandmother who still speaks to her to you know she had her own pantheon if you like yeah yes. um and i and i also interviewed a parish priest and i and i told him without mentioning anybody's names i've spoken to you know a catholic who who many Catholics actually in practice have this rich. He said, no, they don't. I said, what do you mean they don't? He said, no, they, 
I just knew what he was going to say next. They venerate the saints, but they don't worship. They only worship God. And I said, yes, I know that's the ideal. I know that's the doctrine. But in yeah, practice, yeah. You know, in practice, of course, St. Anthony or St. Jude is just as important. To, no, it's not. You know, so the ideology, the doctrine still makes it that you know, she couldn't have told him that. She couldn't have. She'd well, have been corrected. Yes. So you get the, uh, the difference between practice yes. and official teaching in all Every monotheism in practice ends up with an enormous amount of polytheism, but the job of the religious officials is to press it down and yes. get rid of it. But, the, but that's, that's, that's the point. And I, I think what you say is very, very helpful. Uh, that is the point, because it's something Dale um, uh, Allison mentioned in his book on religious experience published just recently, that... Um, uh, and he's an ordained elder in the Presbyterian Church USA, by the way. He's no, um, you know, he, he's a to come as a priest or a minister um and he said you know his experience a lot of religious professionals um you know priests and so on mm. are, are quite down on this phenomena that they, they, they don't you expect them to mm. say oh yes my parishioners are having these experiences yeah it, it's part of this vibrant spiritual reality and yeah we're, we're, yeah. we're, we're great no that's not his no. experience uh, th they're doing precisely what you're saying but mm. but that's the point that they are not acknowledging it they don't approve of it by the way mm. um mm. but it doesn't mean it's not happening though exactly uh, right exactly right. right oh no 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 it doesn't mean it's not happening it means he doesn't want he's absolutely cut off from it and doesn't want to acknowledge it mm. arguably arguably i'm not saying this individual mm. was wrong I, I have no idea but Della De De is suggesting that this is part of the 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 the, the, the rejection or the, because these people have been formed in seminaries and institutions mm. of learning which mm. have become quite secularized and influenced by materialist paradigms of the universe and they don't really want mm. to embarrass themselves yeah we, we, we don't really believe in this sort of stuff that's anymore. another part as well exactly exactly and that's not that's for, and again there is this implicit racism and sexism you know that's for that's for that's for silly people that's for mm -hmm. yes. women and children yeah. and, and you yeah. know the irish fortune tellers and the gypsies there's a lot of implicit prejudice in that um but you've brought us back beautifully to um, um, my main point, really, which is that you have to attend to the diversity of how things are and not impose your ideology on it. Whether it's secular or Nietzschean or religious or monotheistic, it's disguising something more interesting. And modernity, modern societies that we live in, like to think they're pluralistic, but they're not. Modernity exactly. itself, modernity exactly. itself, does not like to look at the hidden pockets that it doesn't yes. want to see. And religion is still one of those hidden pockets in a society such like an important ours. Point, Linda. I'm so pleased you said this because it's such, <laughs> this is a reality check. You're taking the red pill here. You're seeing things not as it's supposed to be, but the reality is exactly, uh, I think it's such an insightful point. Mm. Sorry. And yeah. that's why people don't want to you know, go back to our discussion, is Britain a Christian country and why people don't want to know the answer? Mm. Because the answer doesn't fit people's governing ideologies. That's why people don't want to know it. Gosh, that is such a mm. profound thought. Okay, well, I'm just going to sit here and ponder that for the next hour. But anyway, I'm going to, um, um, but thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Linda. I mean, uh, dare I ask, are you working on any, um, any projects or books that we might uh, look forward to um, in the future? Well, I just, I just finished one, actually, that's just come out. I'll give it a plug. Thank you, called mm. Un Unknowing God. It's my first book of theology rather than yeah. sociology. Yeah. <coughs> I wrote it with a <coughs> former Catholic monk. <coughs> and the main, the main, it's just a series of short reflections, very personal reflections on our, on our spirituality, but <coughs> it's called Unknowing God because it's about how bad ideas about God and religion drive out a living experience, yeah. a living spiritual experience. And I think that's been part of the tale, of actually, of why the churches have declined because people have experienced, you know, have experienced a certain set of things that doesn't seem like a living God and isn't a living God. I mean, is there an allusion in the title there to the, the cloud of unknowing? This kind exactly. of exactly or book, which exactly I, I, exactly. I, I, I should say that because I remember reading that when um when I was um a Catholic uh, in uh, in in a monastery <laughs> of all places, mm. and uh, every day and. Just been totally blown away by it. This is kind of um, mm. so uh, that's why I thought. Hmm. Oh, you're very, very, very well read. No, it's a beautiful, wonderful medieval mystical book, it, 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 making the same point really that we get trapped. Exactly. Trapped in our. We seem to somehow 
project the very worst things about humans onto how we imagine God. And we get trapped in our views of what, what God is. And we use them for our own power plays. The subtitle of the book is Towards a Post-Abusive Theology, because religion is so often used to abuse from the abuse of power. Towards a, towards a post-abusive theology. That's yes. a very powerful subtitle or title. Gosh, okay. <laughs> Is it published? Is it out? It's published. It's published. It's out. Yes. Ongoing okay. God. I'll, I'll link to it in the description below. Um, uh, that sounds. And it's got a lot about uh, the, the 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 fairies and the angels and uh, mm -hmm. the ghosts and uh, what are we to make of them and why don't we think that the resurrected Jesus is a ghost? I will leave you with that question. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Okay, you just open a huge can of worms, which normally I, I jump in with you, but I <laughs> might not be the great time to talk. Are you just uh, are you, so? Have you uh, have you read Dale Allison's recent book on religion? I haven't, and I am going to put it on my Christmas reading list now. Thank I do you. recommend it, Linda. I think you will find it mm. very much on your wavelength. Uh, and uh, and and the video, of course, uh, mm. I wish uh, I spoke to him about it just a matter of days ago. Um, I will have a look. Is it up now? Uh, is, is the video up? You mean or? Mm. No, uh, my, yes, absolutely. Uh, it, it's it's uh, about a week old, I think. Lovely. Uh, I'll take it. It's done very well. I think it's not. Um, I, I mean, in terms of you and numbers, but I, I'm not worried about that. I'm I'm really proud of the video. I think uh, because of of what he said, and is so important mm. for understanding of religion in the modern world. Having an accurate mm. from a very eminent um, uh, professor from Princeton, and um, mm. I think it's fantastic, even though it's not had many views. But I don't care. Um, but uh, that's our link to that as well then in the description below if people want to look at that mm. Mm. so thank you very much indeed uh, Professor Linda Woodhead for your expertise it's been great fun um, and very enriching and I, I do hope a lot of people uh, uh, listen to this or li listen to you uh, read your book and and just re really understanding what's really going on in the world of religions at the moment so thank you very much indeed Linda my pleasure. Take care.